Uh, so if you ever have a question with Ask ZBrush, so the process of this is we have this ZBrush uh, live session of Ask ZBrush, and this will be once every other week. So I'm starting that back up again. So this week, and then I think next week, or not the week after, um, next will be I go again. I got to check my schedule. And then it should be repeating like that. And in between the weeks I go, uh, Paul will be going. So Paul will do the weeks in between, and I'll do it. So every other week is me or Paul, basically is how it ends up. So the Ask ZBrush section on our YouTube page, if you guys send in your questions with the hashtag AskZBrush on Twitter, we get these little things here on Twitter here, and I just do a search basically for Ask ZBrush. And then I'll go through and look at all any of the questions that I can answer, and also answer in a video format. And then after these are done, I usually try to get at least two of these done every week, and we put into our YouTube channel here. And then in here you have all the video answers for these. So 200 of them were what we reached before ZBrush 4.8 was released. So these are all ZBrush 4R7 ones. And the last one we ended on, number 200, is as answering how can I upgrade to ZBrush 4R8. So once again, if you are a license holder of ZBrush, ZBrush 4.8 is a free upgrade. Free upgrade. So there's no reason to sit on 4R7 and not upgrade to ZBrush 4R8. So this video here will show you the process through that. Um, you can also go to the ZBrush Central forums and there's a link that will take you to the download center instructions for upgrading to ZBrush 4R8. And this will have all the processes here. So you just need to have your license and the serial number of ZBrush. So your serial number and registered email address. And then you can request a download link for the new latest version and install it. Now, I highly recommend installing the full download. So we have released one patch for ZBrush 4.8 already. So we're on ZBrush 4.8 P1. So we fixed some bugs right out the gate that you guys have reported. So I'd highly recommend uh, upgrading. And if you're not running P1 of 4.8, definitely upgrade that as well. So just little things there. Uh, 4.8 introduced a lot of new features. So we have the live Boolean system inside of ZBrush, which is one of my favorite things um, in 4.8. And I just absolutely love it. So it's been awesome for creating all sorts of different shapes and not being restricted to only modeling things in a positive method or having to use DynaMesh with the subtraction functionality to get negative shapes. So it's extremely quick, extremely fast, and it's non-destructive, which is another real bonus for the system there. The other thing that's really nice for this latest release is the vector displacement mesh, which you can generate from any grid plane inside of ZBrush. And this will allow you to generate alphas on the surface of your model that have undercuts. And I don't know if you have seen the you know, demos or the videos and stuff that we did, and also some of the artwork that our beta testers have created, but this is like a whole nother level of sculpting on your meshes. And so instead of getting these flat alphas and then after going in and adding all these undercuts, you know, I can like these really complex uh, vector displacement meshes and then apply them to your models and it gives it, the whole model is going to pop. So like teeth and stuff will have undercuts. It's, it's really, really nice. So... And then another one that we have, one more, we're going to go through here, it's quick. <laughs> then I'll go to the chat and see what you guys are uh, talking about there. The gizmo's in. Uh, we also can move multiple subtools, so another really big one for that in ZBrush 4R8. Uh, we've also added uh, deformers, so you have uh, different FFD structures and other things you can do to bend your model. So instead of going to the deformation panel and using that bend slider, you can now use it with a deformer, and this will allow you to take your meshes and bend them and get that precise circle generated out of those. Uh, there's the Alpha 3D stuff, there's the more vector displacement mesh. So this was one of my favorite uh, beta tester pieces done by Pablo here. So the fur on this, like it's really hard to kind of sculpt <laughs> digital fur. And with the vector displacement stuff, you know, you can create a few of these and then when you drag them on your model, you're going to get that nice fur effect. And then we also have this text and 3D shape creator. And if you guys haven't played with this, and you do a lot of stuff, maybe use Illustrator to generate logos, assets, designs. You can now take all those and put them in a ZBrush and generate meshes out of them. So for logos, designs, getting really clean geometry on shapes, it's a really, really nice way uh, to generate different assets. So another big thing there with that. So yes, it is. We are live from my backyard. <laughs> so it is extremely hot where I am uh, right now. So we're looking at 
around in the 90s, 100 degree weather, and then it's also like 90% humidity. So it's it's the temperature here where you'll go in and like say you even like take a shower in the morning and get out of the shower and you're already sweating. So it's it's that kind of weather <laughs> where I'm at here in North Carolina. So it's good times, good times. Uh, so if I do not answer your questions, so definitely start putting them in your chat here inside of Twitch here this morning. And if I do not answer them or I may not be able to answer. I may send you to our support site. So we have a support.pixelogic.com site. And sometimes some of the questions that don't get answered, if I don't answer them, definitely you can always submit a ticket to support.pixelogic.com. And then it will get looked at by our support team. So we have quite a few uh, people that look at all the tickets that come in and answer them. Um, I'm myself included. So me and Paul are on the uh, tiers where if something's really, really crazy, we'll often get hit, hit us. They'll get forwarded to us. So definitely... Um, look for that stuff as well. So I want to hit a few things in relation to ZBrush 4.8 and 4R7. And I see one question came in about this already. One of the items I'm going to hit on. So the first thing I want to talk about is, let me just hop over to ZBrush here, is that we have a, we had a few questions come in on uh, Twitter where they're asking, so can I open models created in 4.8 and 4R7? No, that is something you cannot do. So every time there's a new release of ZBrush, the different version number, there's things that are added that modify how your tools and your files work in the application. So since ZBrush is a free upgrade, you just need to upgrade to ZBrush 4.8. If you have a valid license of ZBrush, just upgrade to ZBrush 4.8. There's no real reason not to upgrade from 4R7 to 4.8. But you will not be able to take a 4R7, 4R8 project and open it in 4R7. Now you can take any 4R7 projects and open them in ZBrush 4.8. And this should work with anything. So we had a question come in about ZPR files. So your ZPR files or your project files from 4R7, from 4R6 should load into ZBrush 4R8. Um, if you're losing things such as, um, we had a few questions came in about undo histories. So you wanna make sure that you, when you save that file out in 4R7, that you had this undo history option on, because if this is off, it's not going to save that project file with undo history. And then there's also in this preferences tab here, if we go down to the, let me find this here, undo history area here, there is also this skip loading of undo history. And so if you're opening a file from 407 into 408 and this is turned on, the skip loading, it's going to skip your undo history as well. So that may be two reasons why you're not seeing undo history from a file created from 4R7 and then trying to open it into 4R8. So if you're not getting undo histories or you're having an issue like that, check this preferences undo history skip loading. Make sure that's turned off. And then make sure when you save that file, you have this undo history turned on. So oftentimes by default, these are both not turned on. And so that could, when you save your project file, make it save without undo history. And if you're saving with undo history, it's definitely going to create duplicates of your mesh, basically, or the topology of it for every undo history you have. So if you have a model that's 6 million polygons and he has 100 undos, just think of it storing all the vertices positions on that mesh, 100 undos, right? So your file size is going to increase if you save out with that undo history. So just another thing to uh, worry about there. And oftentimes when I work on things inside of ZBrush, I only go back undo probably like 10 times or so. And so most of the times, if I commit to something or I want to go back to it later, I'll just go to the subtool palette and I'll just duplicate that tool. So let's say I take the cylinder and I model it to a certain aspect. I'm like, eh, I kind of like that, but I want to try something else. So then I'll just duplicate it. And then now I have a backup of that version, which I had, which was one way. And then I'll go to the other one and I'll modify that one another way. And then that's so I still have these two versions. Or you can just save two separate files as well. So the, that's one thing I want to hit on is just that you will not be able to open 4R8 projects into a lower version of ZBrush. So they won't open in 4R7 and they will not open in 4R6. The next thing I want to quickly hit on is we had a few questions about the transpose line. So the transpose line is not gone. It's still here. So we had questions about, well, how can I measure objects now inside of ZBrush with the gizmo? Like I just have the gizmo. How, how can I measure things? Well, you can toggle the transpose line between the transpose line and the gizmo. So as soon as you go into move, scale, or rotate here, you're going to see I'm going to have the gizmo 3D. 
And then you have this icon at the top, and this is just enabling the Gizmo 3D. And this is also set to the hotkey of Y. So if you disable this, now you get your transpose line back. And now you can go through and use the transpose line just like you did in ZBrush 4R7. So if any time you don't like the gizmo or you need to measure items and you're used to using the transpose line, all you have to do is click Y on your keyboard or come up here and toggle this gizmo 3D. And that's going to switch you from the gizmo to the transpose line. So it's still there, so you can still use all the functionality of the transpose line if you want to. But there's quite a few questions in the... Uh, Twitter feed on that on where's the transpose line and so you just need to toggle this gizmo 3d right here and then we got one more thing and then we're gonna go through the list and see if you guys have started building up uh, questions for me here in the chat uh, well, actually I have two more things we'll do two more things quick because I want to get these out of the way because they're uh, things that have changed in 4.8 and we have had a few questions on them so the other question we've had is the visibility. So inside your subtool palette, the visibility functionality has changed a little bit. So what this means, if now if you have a tool selected and you click this eyeball icon, it's only going to toggle the eyeball icon for that selected tool. So you can see as I'm clicking this on and off, only that subtool is turning on and off. Now inside of 4R7, if you did this, so if you had a selected tool and you clicked the eyeball icon, it would turn off the eyeball icons for everything in your subtool list. So we had a lot of, during development, we had a lot of people send in requests where they're like, I just had all my subtools visibility on, and then I selected one, and I clicked the eyeball icon, and I lost all my visibility. Like, it all changed. Everything I had hidden and unhidden, it all went away. So we changed it so that now, if you just click on it, it's only going to do the one you have selected, unless you hold shift. And if you hold shift and now click on it, now it's going to give you the functionality you had in ZBrush 4R7. So the functionality of hiding and showing all your subtools is still there. You just have to hold shift when you click on the selected subtool eyeball icon. So without it, you're just going to toggle the eyeball icon for the selected tool. And then if you hold shift and click the eyeball icon, you're now going to toggle all of them like it was drawn out again. Now what happened there? You can see that the size is not consistent. Now I never changed the draw size on this mesh. This was 27 the entire time. But as you rotate the model, the distance from what your cursor is seeing on the screen to the mesh has changed. So right now this surface is a little bit closer than this surface, right? And so this draw size, if dynamic is turned off, is going to change based on the camera distance to your mesh. So if you have something like a pair of pants and you're you know, zooming in and out and changing the size and you want to keep this a consistent ratio, it's always going to change depending on how close your camera is unless you have dynamic brush size turned on. So that is the reasoning for why the dynamic brush size consists, exists. It allows you to keep that draw size constant no matter where your model is on the screen. So that 27, if you draw it way back here, so if I turn this on here, and I zoom my model out, and say I draw it at 22, see so I'm going to get that thickness of that line, and then if even if I zoom in and draw it again, I'm going to get the same thickness. So it's going to keep that the same if you have dynamic on, no matter where your model is positioned in the world. So that is why you would use dynamic versus not using dynamic. I usually end up keeping it on pretty much constantly. So. But that was a big thing, for, especially for character work, for definitely clothing and seam lines. It was a huge lifesaver when that was introduced because it just made that stuff so much easier. I didn't have to go and rotate the model and then change my draw size to try to match the draw size I was currently drawing and then increase it and draw it again. So good times, good times. All right. So let's see. We're going to go to the questions now. Lots of things to read through here. See what we got here. Talk amongst yourselves. So the ZPR file for the loading stuff, I see uh, your computer is not reading ZPR files at all. That is a little bit interesting. I'd definitely uh, say go to and go to support.pixelogic.com and submit a ticket on that. There are various things I'd have more questions for you on that process, but as for reading ZPR files, it should be able to read them as long as they are saved. Um, so if you save one out, even if you just start ZBrush 
generate one and then try to load it back in, it should open. If it's not doing that, then definitely uh, submit a ticket to support.pixelogic.com. It could be something involving if you use the upgrader to upgrade from ZBrush 407 to 408, or it could just be something with antivirus. There's all sorts of different things, so definitely submit that ticket to uh, support.pixelogic.com. For, we got another question on the gizmo with multiple subtools. Is there an easy way to recenter or reset the rotation of all of them? It will only affect the selected subtool. So the answer is yes. It will only affect the uh, selected subtool of where that uh, gizmo is going to go. But if you're activating it with multiple subtools, you can position it everywhere and it's going to move all the tools. So if I go to, say, the gizmo here and I activate multiple subtools here and then I unlock and let's say I move the gizmo to his shoulder and lock it again. So this position now with the multiple subtool option is where it's going to use to process the transformation. So it's always going to use this gizmo. So even if I switch to say the eyes and you can see the gizmo for this one is here. If I have this one selected and the gizmo is here, it's going to transform that model with the current subtool you have selected gizmo. So with the demo soldier selected and its gizmo here, if I move this with the option here of turned on of transpose all selected subtool, it's going to move and rotate and scale from that point. But then if I switch to say the eyes here, and now let's say I move this gizmo to say one of the eyeballs, and now move this, it's now going to deform the multiple subtools or translate multiple subtools here based on that gizmo position. So that is the thing there. And so each subtool is going to have its own gizmo position. So if you're looking for a way to recenter all your um, unmasked mesh centers or you know take the thing and do that, it's only going to be looking at the selected subtool. So if you come through and say select the eyes and now I recenter that, it's going to do it based on those eyes rather than the entire tools. So I don't know if that answers that question, but it will only affect um, the selected subtools gizmo. Basically, it's not going to modify the other subtools gizmos. So for another question involving the gizmo, resetting the 3D gizmo to local orientation of the subtools. So the rotation of the orientation of the gizmo, just like the transpose line, is not going to have any reference to a local transformation. It's going to be where it is currently. So there's no, this is my local and this is my world. It's always doing it one you only have one option for the gizmo so if you rotated a model let's get the demo head here and i rotate this and now let's say i go and reset the pivot you're not going to be able to reset this back to the local orientation right so you can try to manually do it but the gizmo is going to only you only have one version of the gizmo so you don't really have a local or a world difference there you have one and it's usually always in think of it as more of like a world gizmo so wherever it's placed that's going to be that now you can unlock this and center it to the unmasked mesh center you can also just rotate it to the world axis of the model so that will go to the zero zero if you click this home button and then the orientation will always rotate to the uh, world axis as well so there's no way for zbrush to tell that this mesh was originally rotated and the gizmo should be going like this, say through the center part of his head, and then the axes would be rotated around that. So it's world axis basically for the gizmo. So there's no local, you're not gonna be able to switch between the two. The streaming times for all the stuff is just on zbrushlive.com. So let me pull that up quick for you guys here. So if you just go to uh, zbrushlive.com, and this will also, you can watch the uh, streamed events as well. So these will be on here. You'll see it's going to attempt to have me watch my own broadcast here, which currently I am Michael Pavlovich. <laughs> I am not Michael Pavlovich. Michael Pavlovich already went today, so you definitely uh, need to check out his stuff. So if you go to schedule here and open this up, this is where the schedule will be. And this should list all the items here for all the upcoming uh, events that will be happening on ZBrush Live. And one thing I forgot to mention on the initial thing is that if you would like to fill one of these blank spots in here, there is a button here that's called Creative Supply here. And you can submit 
and contact our guys that are running the ZBrush Live stuff here and submit to fill in one of these slots. So you too can be on here at a certain time frame using ZBrush and streaming across the world. So definitely uh, we are looking for more applicants for that. We'd like to get this to be 24 seven, you know, seven days a week constantly. So um, just fill up Twitch on our channel here with just ZBrush going all the time. So that way, anytime you wanna tune in or watch some ZBrush, you just come here and somebody will be using our application. So definitely, if you'd like to apply for that, just come over here and click this Creative Supply. I'm still getting through these chats here. Still getting through them. And look, we already, <laughs> they already got the full schedule. Look at that. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. Hopefully the stream is, is back. My internet connection is always, always interesting. So one question about the Z modeler brush. So when using the Z modeler brush and using the action mesh to brush, is that the same option that's in the brush menu? Kind of. <laughs> so here, let's go in here. And let me grab, say, this object. And go to the Z Modeler brush. And I believe this is a poly action. It's been a little while since I've used this one. So if you have a mesh selected and you hover over a poly with the Z Modeler brush selected and you press spacebar to go to the Z Modeler poly action menu, in here you have an option for mesh to brush. And so this will allow you to capture what your mesh is right now to a brush. And you can do this with any of these targets down here. So I'm just gonna click this mesh to brush and just do all polygons and then click. And that is now gonna capture that. So this is similar to going to say the brush from mesh. It'll do a similar option. The thing that's nice about this process is that you can use any of these targets down here. So let's say I only want flat island, right? So I can get this flat island. I can now click this, which is gonna look at this flat island of geometry and you're gonna see I'm now gonna only get that shape. So that will allow you to come through and modify this. So let's say I change my poly group for this area. Oh, let me actually select the right mode here. So I'll change the poly group there. Now I'll hover over this poly, do mesh from brush, poly group all, and click that, and now I have the outer ring. So it's a good way to build up these different parts. Now if you have a Z modeler brush selected, you can see it has these insert mesh icons now that are appearing at the top bar here. But these are gonna be used, if you have the Z modeler brush selected, as a nano mesh. So if you come across your mesh and hover over poly, and now press space bar. To access these, you need to select this insert nano mesh button. And then now it's gonna look at these tools here. And so now I'll be able to take that tool and apply it across that surface. You can see now I've taken that mesh I just stored and now I've applied it as a nano mesh across that poly group. So that's the main functionality for why it exists in the Z modeler brush was to allow you to come through, generate a shape, maybe break the shape off and then apply it as a nano mesh inside the tool. And so you can come through and say, select to these different ones. You can see I can start getting these different Single-sided shapes now applied as a nano mesh across the surface. And if you guys are unfamiliar what a nano mesh is, is it's an option in the Z modeler brush that will look at the polygons of your model and it'll allow you to take a mesh and place it in each of those polygons. And after you have it placed or generated on your model, if you go to the tool palette and then come down to the nano mesh area here, you have a whole different options. So you can actually apply and modify these. So I can come over here and start messing with these and now change this mesh that's now appearing on the surface there. You can also do things like random distribution, even change the seeds. So a lot of cool stuff and a cool effects you can get for surface geometry on a mesh. So if you have a low resolution model and you want to say make random circles appear all over it. So you may be doing some styles of dresses or things like that. You can just quickly come through, use nano mesh with the Z modeler brush and just apply it to the entire surface of the model there. And then come over here and modify this. You can apply random distributions on this uh, to change how this is affecting. And now you can get a different result on your model. All these nano meshes can be converted to geometry. So they'll be converted automatically if you just render with BPR. So if you just come over and click this, you can see it's gonna render out uh, right now, this is a instanced object. So if I go to edit mesh, I'll be able to edit the initial shape here. So let's say I want to give this thickness and go to Q mesh, 
all polygons and then just give this some thickness. Now if I get out of Edit Mesh, you'll see now all those instances of that single nano mesh have been updated and they all have thickness across the surface there. And then if you want to convert it to geometry, you have two options too, so it's still in instance mode here. You can go to this inventory down here and do one to mesh, and this will take that geometry and convert it to a mesh. Or you can come up to the geometry tab here and you have a convert BPR to geo. And I usually end up using this route because when you're using a BPR geo, it's going to give you the same result you're seeing as you rendered the mesh with BPR. So if you come and render it with BPR and you're happy with what you're seeing here, you can easily come over here and click this convert to BPR and now it's going to make all these geometry. So it's going to take what you see in BPR and convert it to geometry. So it's a little bit faster in my opinion than going through and if you have multiple nano mesh indexes and going one to mesh, one to mesh, one to mesh. Um, it's just in my opinion and just come up here and click one button and it's going to take them all, turn them into a single mesh object and then I'll get my result. So that is what the option of Zmodeler Poly Action Mesh to Brush does. So it's just capturing the surface or the mesh on your model and then adding it to that Zmodeler brush and then you can use that as a nano mesh. Now with the new additions inside of 4 h you can now copy these parts around. So let's say I used the Zmodeler brush and I generated this cylinder pipe here or say this half one here. You can now go to the brush palette here and down here in the up here in the create menu we have options to copy parts of brushes move them around delete meshes you can modify these so if you do something with the zmodeler brush say you captured that part you really want to use that part as an insert mesh i can now say copy one mesh there so i just copied that cylinder pipe now i can go and select say a insert mesh we'll do the boolean brush here and now i can add this to it so i can do a paste append which is going to paste it at the end of my chain here and if i scroll my top bar here you'll see now i have that cylinder pipe so now this is embedded as this part has now been transferred from that zmodeler brush to this imm brush and now i can draw this out as an imm part so all sorts of different functionality you can do it so it's nice to capture you know if you just want faces captured rather than coming through and deleting poly groups or things like that you can use the targets in zmodeler brush capture that part copy it paste it in another brush and just keep going from there endless endless possibilities so I hope that answers uh, that question. We went on a little bit of tangents there. Back to the uh, questions here. So questions about the plugins. So yes, um, I have a few plugins uh, that I had working for 4.7. 4.8 uh, uh, went through and broke all these. So I've been going through and actually um, getting them in the work with 4.7 again. And hopefully they'll be out soon. So as time permits, I've been going through. And so the ones I got requests for first, such as the Startup Master and Ringmaster plugin, uh, I am working on modifying those. So hopefully soon they will be available again working with ZBrush 4.8. All the ones now that I had on my Gumroad site uh, have been allocated into a legacy ZBrush 4 or 7 package. So if you have 4 or 7, you can still grab them there. But they pretty much all break um, with ZBrush 4.8 with the additions to the Boolean system and some of the subtool modifications, especially these start group uh, icons here. So yes, they're, <laughs> they're all broken. They're getting fixed. Um, hopefully they'll be uh, finished soon here. Let's see what else we have here. Yes, uh, Clean Tool Master is also on the list there for the plugins that I am looking at to getting fixed. So you guys were killing me with questions. Now you quieted down. Make sure I didn't miss anything. So a question about the working with a file and if I reload to a new project, the last use brush does not work as it meant to. Can you elaborate on that at all? So if you open a ZPR file, it's going to reset um, the values you had stored for the brush. So as an example of this, let's say I take my clay tubes brush here and I change my intensity to say eight, turn RGB on, um, down the intensity. And let's say I was working with this brush. Let's we'll fill this. Yes, we'll do something like this. 
and we'll up the intensity. So let's say I was working on with this brush, right? So this is what I wanted. I've got the clay tubes brush here. Sculpt in, sculpt in, sculpt in. This is the settings. Now if I save this, save as, and then let's reinitialize ZBrush here. So this is basically what ZBrush looks like when it starts up. And now let's say I go in and let's load that file again. And of course it didn't reset my uh, <coughs> brushes here. But you'll see that my RGB intensity has changed, my Z intensity has changed. So it's not storing your brush basically with what it is. So it's only going to store your file and it's not going to remember your brush settings. So if I switch back to that clay tubes, you can see all those changes I had are now different. So I'm not getting that same effect. So you will have to remember what changes you did, especially related to which options you had on or in Z intensity, your focal shift, your draw strength. Um, if you're just using the standard brushes. So that's why if you do the reset um, all brushes here, it's going to return them back to their normal functionality. Um, and then you can go through and reset those settings. But the settings you have stored for a brush isn't going to save with a project file or a tool file. So if you always go and change your intensity to like 10 and then sculpt on a model every time, and you're going to notice that even if you save a project file and reopen that project file, when you select that brush again, you're going to have to change your Z intensity down to 10 again. So those options are not saving with the projects. Now, if you're having a different option where you're sculpting on a mesh and you're noticing that the effect is just totally weird, um, one thing I highly recommend checking out is making sure you do not have a morph target stored on your model. So there were some additions to 4.8 involving the chisel brushes and their functionality of using morph targets. And this will allow you to create a continuous stroke. So if I have the chisel brush here and I draw this out, I'm going to get something like this. And then normally, if you draw across the surface here, you're going to see it's going to give you this kind of transition. So not really what you're looking for. But if you do this process again with a morph target stored, it's now going to use this brush, and when it comes across the surface, it's going to look at the surface and see it as it was originally when you stored the morph target. So it's going to see this as not having this groove carved out, but rather still being that complete surface of the sphere there. So when you drag this brush across, now you're going to get this transition. So it's going to look at the morph target when you're drawing on your model. And occasionally you may find that if you have a morph target on your mesh, and you save the file, load it back up, it may give you a different result because that morph target is stored. So if you're finding that your brushes are handling differently between saves, and it's not just gen based around what options are turned on and off, check to see if that model has a morph target, and then just delete it, and then see if that brush works again. So another thing there to check out uh, for that. So that could potentially uh, be what it is. If it's still giving you uh, weird results, uh, definitely uh, submit a ticket to support.pixelogic.com. Back to questions. Let's see what we got here. Wait for it. Wait for it. So a question about the bridge and Keyshot 7. Uh, not quite sure on that. I know there are plans in the works. I am not fully aware of them, though. I know they are being thought out, and they are. They do have a plan. We do have a plan for that. I just cannot uh, vouch for exactly what that is at this time. Um, but there will be probably an update to the bridge uh, when Keyshot 7 gets released. I can't verify that, so don't take my word for it. Um, I have not been in the, the conversations for that, but yes, I assume that there will be an update for that when seven, Keyshot 7 gets released. So another question, when I use DynaMesh and change the resolution, the mesh won't update unless I make changes to the first. And that is correct. That is just the functionality of DynaMesh. So it allows you to not DynaMesh a model by accident, basically. And so if you turn it on initially, you're going to see that I have a DynaMesh sphere here with 128, and then if I say change this to 256, see I'm not going to get an update on my model, so my resolution didn't change. So you can come through and try to 
Redynamash using this, even turning this on and off, and you're going to see that since the surface of your model has not changed, the Dynamesh is not going to kick in and Redynamesh your model. So to get this to process, basically you can come through and you can slightly move it. And I think that will allow that change to happen. Nope, I lied. <laughs> you can smooth the surface, so just hold down shift and tap. And then now if you redynamesh, it should update. <laughs> or I may have lied again. Let me let me let me uh get this working here quick. Yeah, so you just have to change the surface of your mesh. So anything you do involving, say, like, you know, sculpting on it and then redynameshing, it's going to now update with that resolution. Even just sculpting on it and redynameshing, smoothing it out, any surface change, uh, Dynamesh is going to look for that. And then if you change your resolution, that's not a surface change, so that is definitely not going to update. And that's why you're not seeing the change when you type in a new resolution without changing your model first. Now, if you save it, save the project and then reopen it, and then activate Dynamesh, it should change the resolution. Um, so, but that is the reason why there, why you may not be getting a result on your mesh. Definitely with changing just the resolution. So yes, you do have to sculpt, make a little change. You can undo the change. Um, but definitely you just need to do something to the surface topology. And then when you read Dynamesh, change the result. Unless you're just trying to find the initial kind of resolution. So if you have your model, you can say Dynamesh first at this resolution. Uh, might be too dense. Just undo and then change it again. And change it again. So the whole process of Dynamesh is just kind of like base mesh building. So you start with a resolution. You pull it out, pull it out, and then redynamesh, pull it out some more, sculpt on it, redynamesh. And then at a certain stage, you may want to increase the Dynamesh to add, say, fingers to a mesh, a little more details, pull some things out. Then you increase the resolution, but most of the times when you're doing that, you've already changed the mesh beforehand, so when you update the resolution, then you'd see the, the change. But that is the main thing there. And if you guys have ever played around with uh, just taking a sphere and creating uh, different meshes out of it using Dynameshes or just base meshes, one thing that's really awesome uh, with Dynamesh here, let me just uh, get my resolution here back to this. The snake hook brush is awesome. Uh, for kind of generating limbs and forms on a character. So as an example of this, let's say I have my sphere here. We're going to go a little bit lower here. And now I'm going to take my snake hook brush here. Let me find my axis here. Are you at floor grid? There you go. You can take the snake hook brush and start you know, dragging things out, which is pretty fun, um, especially with move. So this allows you to kind of create instant creatures pretty much using uh, just Dynamesh, Snake Hook, and Move. So you can see I pulled these out. I can now smooth these, pull these out again. You can then also use uh, Inflate, which is another good one to just add thickness to your parts. Then you can re-Dynamesh that. Then I switch back to the Snake Hook. Maybe add some fingers. Re-Dynamesh, add some fingers. Then you can move these around. Make some creepy, creepy alien ghost blobs. But that's another uh, really cool thing with using Dynamesh that uh, definitely is uh, sometimes overlooked. Like people don't ever think about using Snake Hook to generate, say, limbs and stuff. So instead of using Move, you know, you can come through and quickly just try different forms on your mesh. So now I've got, <laughs> I don't know what I got. <laughs> we got something here. And then just redynameshing, snake hooking, redynameshing, snake hooking. You can start getting uh, some interesting designs for characters and creatures pretty quick. And then after you have all that, you can definitely go into, say, the Gizmo 3D, activate the customize here, and then use any of these crazy uh, deformers. So you can use like things like Twist and come through and start manipulating your creatures and your surface. And then I got them looking backwards for some reason. Now he's going to be twirly. So all sorts of different things you can get yourself into <laughs> really quick. So this is the the fun, mindless uh, sculpting aspect if you're looking for random creatures of designs. Snake hook, Dynamesh, and then even playing with some of the deformers. And now I've got some sort of weird chicken thing with some sort of random neck. <laughs> so fun times, fun times.
Yes. Ashley would do a way better job than me. <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there. She'd, she'd have a much better looking uh, random chicken ghost than I, I can generate. All right. So let's see what else I got here. I can probably run into some more things here. So we've got a few more minutes here for this session. So another thing I just want to hit on is uh, the boolean system here quick so talked about it earlier as being like one of the systems that i really enjoy using inside of zbrush here and just want to go through the process just to see if you guys you know give you kind of an update or a re teaching of it, the uh, processes here so the live boolean system inside of zbrush is going to look at the multiple subtools you have in a model and allow you to create boolean objects out of them and so why is this different from say other applications and why would I use this? I guess is the other question we often get with this. So the main thing is that there may be times inside of ZBrush where you want to model a shape, but you can't model it easily because you'd have to do like a lot of subtractions or a whole bunch of processes inside of ZBrush. And this was definitely an issue inside of 4R7. So let's say I have this shape here, the cylinder, and now let's say I want to cut maybe like a circular kind of part out of this. So maybe like a capsule shape or something I want to cut into this. So if you were to do this normally, you know, you could say come through and start sculpting this out. I could try to mask some areas here. Let me uh, divide this up, but I can mask this out. I can then maybe delete some surfaces. I can then maybe bridge some holes and then try to do it, but I'm not going to get that really clean shape I was looking for. So with the Boolean system here, you can just simply add another shape and then create a subtractive part from that. And this allows you just to expand on you know, creating objects using negative space. So thinking of negative assets and then subtracting things out. And one thing nice about the ZBrush 4R8 system is that you're not restricted to using just low polygon meshes. You can use DynaMesh meshes. You can use, you know, anything inside a ZBrush and you can use that with the Boolean system. So instead of just using, you know, isoline cages and meshes that just have subdivisions applied, you can use, you know, pretty much whatever you want. So it's handy for those processes. So I'm just going to take this cylinder pipe here. Now I've applied some dynamic subdivision. So after all that talk about um, <laughs> using DynaMesh models, we're just going to use a dynamic uh, subdivision one here because that's what I want to do. And then I'm going to come through here and I'm just going to append in, say, a capsule object here. So now I just have two subtools. This one I'm going to activate dynamic subdivision two. So I'm going to come down to the geometry tab here. I'm going to turn on dynamic. And I'm going to increase the smoothness slider here so I don't see any of those faceted edges and then I'm gonna hit W on my keyboard to switch to the move gizmo here the gizmo 3d I'm gonna make sure my lock icon is locked so I can move the object here once again I hit on this earlier in the stream but I'm gonna hit on it again <laughs> if you want to switch to the gizmo you want to switch to the transpose line it's still there it's still inside of ZBrush 4 8 you just need to come up here and toggle the Gizmo 3D or press Y on your keyboard and this will switch back and forth between the transpose line and the Gizmo 3D. So if you like using the transpose line, you like measuring stuff with the transpose line, you can toggle it just by coming up here and clicking this button and that will allow you to get back to that Gizmo or get back to the transpose line that was in ZBrush 4 7. So it's just a toggle button right here and the hotkey for that is Y. So hitting on that again, because we did have quite a few questions on Twitter on where's the transpose line, and I can't measure stuff. It's still there. It is still there. So now I've taken these two objects, and I've just generated this here. And now if I go to my subtool palette, I can activate the live Boolean option up at the top here. And this is going to enable this live Boolean process. And then in the subtool palette, I can just set this capsule part here, or this subtool, as subtractive, and it's now going to subtract out of that form. And this is all dynamic. It's in a preview mode with Live Boolean, so I can come through and modify this. I can tailor this. So you can change this any way to your liking. Now you can also modify the existing shape as well. So let's say I don't like the back part of this being round. Maybe I want it to be flat. Well, instead of, say, going in and remodeling that out, well, I could just use the clip brush inside of ZBrush, right? So I can hold Control and Shift and get the select rectangle. Then I can select this and then grab, say, the clip curve brush here. Now I have this part still selected. So if I activate solo, this is what I have selected. Now I can come through and use this clip curve brush and then maybe just clip the back here. So just clip that entire thing in 
and you see it's going to update that model. So I've just affected the model that's being generated as subtractive with another tool inside of ZBrush. So just using the clip brush, I didn't go in and remodel it or do anything else with it, I just clipped it. And so now I'm getting a different result there, and now I can use this to my advantage, modify that a little bit. If I didn't like that clip that I did, I can always undo it and get it back, modify it back again. So you can see it, it's very forgiving in the a way you can try to modify, change shapes, move things around the fly, and not have it destroy anything, right? I haven't changed anything between these two models, and I'm just kind of experimenting and trying to find different shapes. You can also use the array mesh functionality. So let's say I want to take this capsule and now array it around the pipe, so I want multiple of these. So another option you can do is just go to array mesh, and in here I can just turn array mesh on. Now I want it to go from the center of the world, so which is basically the center of this cylinder here. So I'm going to turn transpose on for the array mesh option here. I'm going to turn on lock position, and now I'm going to click reset. And that is going to take the pivot point of my array mesh, of my array here, and it should put it in the center. So now I can rotate this, and let me find the correct axis here. It's one of these. Let me get out of, uh, let me solo this so I can see what's going on here. Always breaking stuff. Always breaking stuff. This is what happens when I try to do it live. <clears throat> so now I can see I'm arraying that part around that central point. And so since I clicked that reset after I turn the array on, it's going to go right to the center of the world rather than the center of the part. So I can see I can manipulate this. I can now change the repeats on this. And now I have some sort of crazy hex screw part here. And this is still all dynamic, right? So if I come to my subtool palette here, I can turn this on and off. And you see that's just the cylinder. And now I got this version. Let's say I want to try a different thing so I can duplicate that. And then let's turn off this one, go to this one. Let's change the array process on this. Maybe I want less repeats. So maybe I want something. Threes are always hard to do in modeling. So we'll do maybe two to three on those. mesh back on. So now I got something like this. And now I have two versions of this. So I can say, okay, I like this one. And then I got this one. Then if I want to create these, you know, I can just create them as meshes and get the two versions of them as true geometry. Or I can just leave them like this. They don't have to go anywhere. They can just live in the subtool palette as this. And now I have my two versions. If I want to split these off so I can have two of them, what you can do here is you have these start groups you can turn on. So you can click this button here, and this will enable a start group. And you can think the start groups as starting and stopping the Boolean operation. And this will allow you to take Boolean operations and then subtract them from other Boolean operations. So I can now separate these. So I have my capsule 1 and capsule 2. I'm going to duplicate my pipe. So now I have two pipes. I'm going to move one down and set that as a start, and then set the other as a start. So now I have this start group, which is going to give me this shape. And then I have this start group. Remember, hold shift will toggle the visibility like it did inside of ZBrush 4R7. And now I have this start group. And if I turn this one off and turn on subtractive, I now have my two parts. So I have two separate parts of this. And now I can take this a little bit further. Let's say I want to offset this one and move it so I can put them side by side. So now I can switch to, say, the Move Gizmo 3D. I can activate that Transpose All Selected Subtools, move both these guys off. Since the array is based on the center of the pivot, we need to first convert that to geometry. So I'm just going to click Make Mesh on that. And now I can move both of these off to the side. Now I can get out of that Move Selected Transpose and put the other one on. And now I can turn on my Live Boolean. And now I have both these guys living in the world like this. So a lot of flexibility with this. You're not just restricted to doing one Boolean process across your model. You can break them up into multiples, and then you can also subtract from that. So just think of it as a hierarchy. So as you go from top to bottom, it's going to look at these start groups, and then it's going to give you an end result, and then you can take that and subtract it from another part if needed. So you just got to think of it in a hierarchical fashion, and then if you want to convert these to geometry, you just need to go to the Geometry tab here. We can go down to the the subtool tab in the boolean area, turn this uh, make boolean mesh here. This is going to process anything that's visible. So it's going to process this start group and this start group. I'm going to get two files out of this. So I'm going to get this part and this part. And this is going to give me now a new mesh at the top here. And the process to create a mesh from your boolean preview is extremely fast. So it's like crazy fast, like to the point where <laughs> we don't even like talk about it much because it's just like, 
it's so fast. And it works with millions of polygons and models. So now I have these two parts, and they're all clean. And if you look at the topology on these guys too, just another thing that I'm pointing out again here, if you guys watched the initial preview here, is that the topology only changed where the intersections happen. So this is another huge thing. So this is the, all the topology from those capsule shapes that were right around, and this is the original topology from the cylinder shape that I had started with too. And it's all the same. So keying, stuff for 3D printing, things like that, you can go through and you know, make keys on your model and not have to update the Dynamesh, not have to have that resolution change because your bounding box in your model changed, right? So if you have a mesh and you just want to add a key joint or a different part to it, you can just use the Boolean system. It's going to keep the topology of your original meshes except for where it transitions. And so that's going to allow you to, if you have an arm and you sculpt it on it, right, and then you have it set up for keying and then your art director or somebody comes back and they're like, hey, we need another muscle there. <laughs> you didn't rob a lionhearted enough. We need one more muscle in his arm, right? So then instead of going back and having to redo that keying process and redoing everything else, since you use the Boolean system, you have your mesh with enough topology already in that Dynamesh mode and the key already set up, you can now sculpt that muscle back into it. So you don't have to sculpt it back on the original model and then redo the keying process. You can just go and make that change. So another big addition, um, just using the live Boolean in its non-destructive kind of format and then also using it with, uh, you know, the make Boolean mesh to take that geometry and hold the topology on your original mesh. So I know a lot of times in 4R7, if people were working with really large models and they went to, you know, cut stuff out or change it, the Dynamesh resolution they needed to hold the de detail on the shape and also perform the cuts was often higher than what their machines could handle. So this is a solution to that. So now I can use a live Boolean instead of those Dynamesh processes, and it's going to make things a lot easier and give you a a lot cleaner result. <laughs> kind of looks like Greek pillars. <laughs> really, really, really sad Greek pillars. All right, so I got time for one more question, if you guys have any of them out there. I also forgot to tell you guys, I kind of have a little head cold, so I sound a little congested, so I apologize that as well. Toddler plagues. And then, once again, uh, next week will be Paul. Paul will be going for his Did You Know That stuff. So if you have any questions on any of the stuff inside ZBrush 4.8, definitely hit up him as well. Uh, once again, our Twitter feed is just hashtag AskZBrush. So you can go through there and just send your comments that way. Let me go through and see that. And just put them in there with AskZBrush, and we'll try to answer those. The... Resuming of the Ask ZBrush section, which will be volume two, should be resuming hopefully this week. Um, we're finalizing some things, so we should have new Ask ZBrushes update, updated this week. And then um, we'll just be going through that same process, and hopefully we'll get up to another 200 or so videos answered just using 4R8. If you guys are not upgraded to 4R8 and you have a license of ZBrush, it is a free upgrade. Free, 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 free. So upgrade your version of ZBrush. There's no reason not to. The floating license are also available now. Um, we also have had one patch for ZBrush 4R8, which fixed some of the issues that the community had found with the initial release. So definitely make sure you have upgraded your ZBrush to P1 as well. If you would like information on how to proceed with the update from ZBrush 4R8 to ZBrush 4R8 P1, if you go to support.pixelogic.com, it is the latest news on the page here and it will show you all the information on how to upgrade to P1. So all the information is right here on this page. Um, if you're looking for other things that will be happening on our Twitch channel, you can go to our broadcast calendar here, which is available at zbrushlive.com, and if you click on Schedule, you'll have a schedule of all the presenters that will be coming on, and they're all by date, so you can see all the people that are scheduled. So later today, we'll have Shane Olson. If you guys have not seen Shane Olson in action, it is a pleasure to watch, so I highly recommend tuning in to his time here at 7 p.m. PST. All these times are in specific time here, so make sure you just have those set up. You can also sign up for weekly digests, and I think there's also the option to sign up for alerts as well. So you can definitely get alerts for when these events are happening, and so that way you get reminders, and then you can tune in. 
So we have one more question here. Let's see if we can get this quick. So question is, is there a way to take an SVG and then wrap it around, say, a sphere and Boolean that? Well, yes. So let's see. Let's see if I can find my, uh, my SVG uh, files here. They're here somewhere. Let me find these quick. Wait for it. Wait for it. coming all right so let's copy this so here we have our little z-man here and we're just going to edit this bring him a little more resolution through here and then maybe let's give him some happy beveling a little bit of happy beveling there. I'll turn off my polyframe so you guys can see this. So this is using the text and uh, 3D vector, text 3D and vector shape creator. And here you have the ability to change, uh, to take SV SVG files. So you create, say, Illustrator or Inkscape and then import them in. And it will generate topology from them. So this is the mesh that's generated from that. You can also use text. So look for any text files or fonts on your um, computer and you can use those as well so you can type out text and then convert it to 3d and then use those on your models so the question is asking saying taking an svg like this and then putting on a sphere and then subtracting it so what's just the process for that so first i just generated this from that svg i've added some bevels so i got this shape here and i'm now just going to append a sphere to the scene here so i'm going to, go to append and we're going to go and we're going to do a low resolution sphere here. Let me find this polysphere here. Let's see if I got undos on this still. Not enough. We'll get a sphere 3D instead. And make my holly mesh on that. And I'm just going to pen this to my scene here. So it's a little low resolution version of the sphere here. And I'm just going to use my gizmo to move the sphere to the back here. And then maybe scale it up a little and move it back. So at this stage, you have a few different options in how you can deform uh, this SVG shape we had created and kind of get it to adhere to our sphere. So one option you could use is the matchmaker process. So if I select the mesh here and I go to my brush palette, there is a matchmaker brush. And this will allow you to take your mesh and deform it to the object that's behind it. So if I come across here and drag out, you see it's going to take that shape and it's going to deform it to the surface like so. So if you're creating insignias on arm pads and things like that, that's one uh, good way to do it. You'll notice that when I did this, you'll see I'm getting some of these uh, lines that are showing up on the mesh. And this is just related to the topology of the vector shape here. So the vector shape is going to give you a clean result and a flow that's around the mesh, but if you're going to end up start deforming it, you may need to add a little more topology to that or convert it to a DynaMesh before you bend it, right? So depending on how that text is created, you may need to take it and just convert it to give it more even topology through the surface. So I'm just going to turn this into a DynaMesh quick. So I'm going to DynaMesh here. Still have that logo selected. And my set my resolution to say, let's try 512, turn off blur. That will give me now a mesh that has a lot more topology in it. So now if I use this matchmaker option and drag this out, you see it's going to bend it like so. You also notice that since my sphere had facetting on it, you can see that the matchmaker even captured those edges into the surface there. So it's going to look at the surface of your mesh you're projecting it onto and also kind of give that result to it. So it's very precise in how it projects. So you can see it's even picking up the faceted, ed faceted edges on that sphere. So I'm just going to undo that and I'm going to divide my sphere up just to give it a little more quality there and now redo that matchmaker process. So I have the logo selected, have the sphere selected, click and drag. So I'm now matchmaking that. Now I can take my logo here and I can now move it. So I'm switching to the gizmo, just moving it so it interpenetrates that surface there. And now let's say I want to just subtract that out of my sphere and change my hierarchy order here. So I want the sphere to be above my Z-Man logo here. And the logo is below. With the logo below, I'm going to make sure I have the live boolean system on and then I'm gonna change that logo to subtractive. So now it's going to read that as a subtractive mesh. 
and I can see it's taken that logo and now cutting it out of the surface of the model. So now I can take the Z-Man and move this in or out to generate how much depth I want on that. You can even scale it, modify it, do whatever you want to do with it, and you can see it's going to be now shown as that subtractive form. So that is a quick way to come through and generate a SVG, generate 3D from an SVG, and then take that SVG, apply it around a sphere, and then use it as a Boolean subtractive object. Now you could also, instead of using Matchmaker to deform our Z-Man here, we could also come through and say use any of the deformers. So if I put him back to positive here, I'm now going to move and then click this gizmo here. You can use any of these bend deformers here as well. And these will give you the ability to bend the mesh. So you can come through and start messing with these and get different bend results on the model. We can find the right cone here. And so you can use this to deform that shape as well getting it to bend around a surface. You can apply multiples of these, so you don't just need to use one, you can start using multiple of these, so you can use even freeform deformation. You can even use the bend arc, which will allow you to generate different points across the surface, and then you can manipulate each of those points to get that tailored shape. And then after that is bent around that object, we can now just send it to subtractive again, and then move it into the surface. So I'm gonna get out of it and accept it, and then move it in the surface, maybe increase the depth values here. And you start seeing that if I bend it at the more precise angle, I end up having it, you know, carve evenly into the surface. But that's another method you can use with the SVG shapes and also using just the deformers uh, to start manipulating your models. So, hope that helps. <laughs> Does that answer that question at all, or am I totally wrong? If you want to, you also, you know, depending on what you have, you know, definitely the curved solution or the bend solution would allow you to wrap it around it. If the object is that perfect sphere, you just need to find the size to wrap it around it. If you want it to engulf the complete shape, you're going to have to play with a lot more of the kind of deformers to kind of bend it across the surface there. Um, you could also, if you just want it carved out, what you could do is just use a tiling texture, um, unwrap the sphere, apply that as a tiling texture, and then you could generate the geometry through, say, a morph difference or even just uh, extracted topology. So you could take the texture map of that pattern, apply it around the sphere, um, use masking to isolate that pattern. Then you can generate and extract from that, which will give you new topology. Then you can subtract that extract from your original mesh, which will give the result too. So you're just, there's a lot of ways um, to go by doing that, uh, basically. But if you're doing it from an SVG shape, and you want to wrap it around it, it's going to come up to more of a manual kind of deformation process using, say, the deformers with the bend arcs, the bend curves, or the deformer primitive here to get it to tailor where you want it on that mesh. All right. So that is it for this session here. So thank you all for turning up in the early morning of... Uh, Pacific Standard Time there, so it is almost, it's 11.30 here, so <laughs> I've been up for a few hours, but if you're on the uh, West Coast there, it's a little bit early still. So thank you all, and once again, if you have any questions involving uh, ZBrush and you'd like to see them answered, so anything, think about it as if there's any answers that can be done in a video format, that <laughs> usually helps, um, definitely use the hashtag AskZBrush. And I'll go through these on a weekly basis and at least answer at least two per week. And these will be answered on our YouTube channel through our Ask ZBrush system here. And we have 200 answers currently using ZBrush 4.7. So we're now, since ZBrush 4.8 is released, we will be starting Ask ZBrush version, Ask ZBrush volume two. And that will be focusing on just ZBrush 4.8. So any questions you guys have, um, definitely send them over. If your question does not get answered, it may be because there is no solution or perhaps because it is more in depth than what I can answer in a video. So if you do not get a reply or see anything um, from us on that and it's still happening, definitely submit a ticket to support.pixelogic.com and then our support team will look at the question you've submitted as well and see if they can get that resolved for you. So multiple venues for getting your questions answered. So thank you all for coming out, and I hope you guys have a great day. And uh, definitely tune in later to Shane Olson. So he'll be demoing later this evening. So that's it. Happy ZBrushing. <laughs>